Uh, without further ado, I am Sabrina Jimenez from Crafton Hills College. I am a Guided Pathways lead, one of several fabulous Guided Pathways leads at our college. And I will be giving this presentation with Gio Sosa. Gio, would you like to introduce yourself? Right. Morning, everybody. My name is Gio Sosa. I am the Dean of Institutional Effectiveness. I am one of many researchers at our college. Excellent. So the title of our presentation is Guided Pathways, The Bottom Line. And this was largely inspired by our presentation itself, but also by um, the skillful knowledge of our president, uh, Kevin Haran, and uh, what he gleaned from this presentation that we're going to give to you today. And so I wanted to introduce ourselves first, but also I wanted to tell you about a little game we're going to play to keep you engaged. And that is you have to count how many Roadrunners are in this PowerPoint presentation. And at the ending of the PowerPoint presentation, you, the winner gets glory. That's what you get. And glory is something that we all want and strive for. And so our mascot is the Roadrunner. And that's going to be our little fun to engage you. And uh, so make sure you pay attention. It rewards people who showed up on time, obviously, because I'm moving forward with the slide. One of the key characteristics that we have utilized in implementing Guided Pathways has been our excellent leadership on our campus. And I want you to keep in mind that when we advise you about what we've been doing as far as our Guided Pathways uh, tasks on our campus is concerned, I want you to know that this is something that you have to constantly nurture. Constant nurture is required. It's like a ship with sails you need that gust of wind to push it forward. Otherwise, it's dead in the water. And so uh, that is something that we've been implementing in our college is really utilizing the good leaders that we have on campus. And so these are some of the features that good leadership does at our college. And that is one creates a culture of teamwork. We have incredible team players at our college campus and that requires us to communicate effectively. And that's something that we have to constantly remind ourselves to do because I've noticed on campuses that there is a lot of individuals doing incredible work and other people on campus don't know about that work, but we need to communicate with one another, create a campus environment that's really working as a team effort because we're all in this together and you can't do that without good <coughs> communication. We also delegate and trust the faculty and staff to accomplish tasks. The vice president of our college, uh, Keith Wirtz, has done a really fantastic job of delegating and trusting us to get the work done. And in that, he's allowed us freedom and creativity. And I want you to know that I myself have just uh, been a bit of a goofball um, in a lot of the processes that we've been doing as we implement Guided Pathways, and he has never stopped me. He's never tried to crush my personality and he allows me to be me and that's a good leader, okay? You have to allow people to bring their personalities to this effort. And with that in mind, he promotes pluralism and diversity. And this is something that uh, every college should do. This is a democratic project and we want to have a lot of input from a lot of different players. Uh, we don't want one single-minded idea or concept being pushed forward. There are so many people that offer so much information. And one of the key characteristics of good leadership in that respect is emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is needed in this Guided Pathways effort because there's a lot to be taken personally when implementing Guided Pathways for everybody all over campus. <laughs> And so implementing Guided Pathways, we need to channel that emotion for a greater purpose. And when I talk about leadership, I'm talking about a collective leadership from the top down to the bottom, from the bottom to the top, all levels of leadership. We're all leaders in our own way. And Gio has done a fantastic job in his field as a leader uh, by really providing the campus with data so that we can make data-based decisions because those data-based decisions, they are there so that we can put the students first. And we're gonna talk about that more a little bit later in the presentation. Right. But just, if I may, for just a moment, just to interject there, just to give you a sense, and, and as Sabrina just noted, we're gonna come right back to this as well. But just to give you a sense for this, 
someone from the research office is on virtually every single shared governance committee and the vast majority of any work group. In fact, one of the first questions that's asked when any work group is formed is where's research? Where's research? They need to be here. And what I'll, the second thing I wanna stress is that we're not simply there to, to provide information. We are there as active facilitators of any conversation having to do with translating that information into action items. So we're not simply there to uh, drop tables or figures on people. We are active discussants regarding whatever matter is on a table. Absolutely. Gio, what's the bottom line? Bottom line here. The bottom line here for you all is that leadership is a shared and collective action. Yes, and I think that image does a lot of justice to what we're trying to convey here. Our leaders work really hard with us. They don't just tell us what to do. They have been a part of this action and an attempt to implement Guided Pathways successfully. With that in mind, they're also trying to bring that same leadership skill into hiring the best people to do the job and not just the best people, but also the people that reflect our college community because all of the students in our community need models of excellence to look up to. And I'll give personal examples of that later on in the presentation, but we are emphasizing hiring practices focused on equity principles. And human resources is really trying to implement new practices, best practices in order to achieve that. Gio, have you had any experience with that personally? I, I sure do. I, and I'm fairly confident I'm not the only one, but in, in our department, as you would expect in any department, uh, we do spend a time going through some of the, the basics. That is, there, there are tools that, that are foundational to the work that we do. And, and yes, we do that work and that is important work. But my mantra, and this is something that that is near, near and dear to, to my heart, something I learned from people I, I truly admire. And that is that the smarts are in the room. I, I may have the experience that I do, but truly, truly the smarts are in the room. The others have so much that they bring to the table. I am so blessed that to, to work with the talented group that I do. And on a daily basis, I tell you, I rely heavily on them and on their insights to not just implement innovative or, or rigorous uh, methods in doing the work that they do every day, but also in helping me see the vision, helping me establish a vision for how we can use this information, how we can use it to improve that student experience. And I would like to emphasize the idea that a lot of a college budget goes into hiring and it goes into professional development activities and how we use our budget is our value statement as a college. So it must be based on equity principles. And we've really tried to emphasize that in our professional development trainings. And um, we are getting increased uh, participation from faculty and staff. Uh, not only do our faculty and staff attend professional de de uh, development trainings, but they also actually lead them um, as well. And these are examples of some of the professional development activities that we've had recently, uh, understanding microaggressions as a form of racism. A lot of us have been attending the USC trainings for equity that have been incredibly helpful in engaging people in a conversation about equity on campus. Uh, two, overcoming challenging situations in the online environment by fostering positive interactions and relationships. And three, reflection, theory, and action on becoming an equity-minded educator. And we have a variety of trainings that we constantly offer throughout each semester, not just for teaching faculty, but also counseling and staff and administration as well. And we all work together as a team. And with that in mind, we see uh, new hire cohorts forming on campus. Uh, one of our, our deans, Kay Weiss, has done a really good job of getting that cohort together as far as the instructional faculty are concerned, because you want to create a cohort. Cohorts are, according to the data, successful. And people, nobody likes to feel completely isolated. Um, and in this environment, it is easy to feel isolated. So it is important, again, to have good leadership on your campus from the bottom up, top down, however you look at it, and leading from the middle as well. And you need to have that leadership that blows wind into that sail to assure that that cohort continues and doesn't die. So with that said, Sabrina, what's our bottom line? <laughs> 
Well, Gio, our bottom line is choose the right people, train them, train them properly, and create a cohort culture. And we've been doing that, and we need to continue to do that. Again, these activities require constant nurture, and so it is essential to keep pushing that forward. We also relay that to students as well, and that's what we're going to be discussing here. Um, we have to all share the responsibility and accountability with that in mind. And sometimes those discussions can be uncomfortable when we are holding each other accountable. And we've had those discussions on our campus and they were uncomfortable. They were borderline terrifying in some cases. And um, you know, we can uh, mention a little bit about those examples later, um, but the students should be part of this discussion. Um, and we need to include students more in shared governance. We are here to serve our students. And GEO is going to speak to ways in which management and administration has been really getting students involved. And oh, absolutely. Um, attendance at student Senate meetings is a regular occurrence. I I've been there multiple times. I was just there, I, in fact, a couple of weeks ago. And I know uh, our executive leadership is there, I think, on, 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 on a regular basis, maybe even every single meeting at that. And beyond just attendance at these meetings, Students are involved in a shared governance process. Uh, we, we still have work to do, but I can give you an example from just earlier this week where we were having this great discussion, at probably an hour long discussion on our mission, vision and values. And we have a student representative on that group that just did a fine job of articulating that voice from the student Senate. And I would go further advocating for that student's perspective. And it was th th those those insights went a long way in really cementing the focus that we have moving forward. And that's just one committee. There's I can give you other examples like our Ed Master Plan Committee. We have a, yet another student there that's so engaged in looking at the evidence and asking what what I see as the right questions, the right questions that will help us again move forward and translate that information into action items. Absolutely. And, and I think we as a college try really hard to constantly get students involved and really connect with the students in a variety of ways. A lot of our faculty and administration are uh, heavily involved in student life and clubs. And I recently um, had a great experience with our multicultural club and they held a multicultural day in which they shared uh, aspects of a variety of cultures that they all came from. And it was really a, a beautiful moment in which the college community came together to ce celebrate diversity. And the president of that club, uh, Ashley, is, is just a fantastic leader on campus. And she is one of many of our students that have really kind of paved the way for some of these equity discussions. And she has done that, uh, not just as part of her club activities, but also in the Honors Institute as well, which is an incredible format for students to uh, present their research and the work that they've been doing at our college and also delve into some of these difficult topics and they also participated in some of our USC equity uh, discussions as well. And they've just been incredible leaders on campus. And our students have the skills and the knowledge to help and share this responsibility and accountability. And we need to make them feel like they are part of the decision making. And that is the bottom line. Absolutely. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> So that, as you might imagine, and I suppose all of us have experienced this, the online services have increased. I mean, it's just the nature of the beast here with the situation that we're navigating. Um, and, and this goes without saying, I suppose, as well, we all share this. Our focus at the college is in implementing uh, programs and services that work, that have discernible impacts on student success. Uh, indeed, our, our, our focus is on, in fact, scaling things that have those discernible impacts, scaling them so that all students have that access to those programs and to those services. And we do this via our high impact practices, our HIPs. We do this via our amazing student services that we offer our students. And of course we do this through our amazing, fabulous instructional uh, support activities. The one that I wanna highlight for you all specifically is tutoring. And you see the chart there on the right. The, the one thing I will add before I even get into the, the numbers here, something again, to go back to some of these core principles. Um, when we venture to look at evidence or look at data, we're not just thinking about it in the aggregate. So when we ask ourselves, 
for instance, what's the impact in this context? What's the impact of tutoring? Right? Is tutoring helping the, the, the students pass their classes? We go further. We always go further. And whenever the time allows, we, in fact, we create dashboards that help people better understand and work with the data themselves. And in doing that work, we have, we're able to achieve a degree of specificity because when you disaggregate the information, you get down to the point where you can see where those gains or maybe even lack thereof might be. And that I think is a good segue into looking at this chart where we're looking at the course success rates for fall 20 of our students that accessed or did not access tutoring services. And again, with that disaggregated lens in mind, in fact, we're looking at that information by discipline. So the first thing that may catch your eye, this is the first thing that caught my eye, is just those robust changes that you see for English, for psychology, and to extent also for math. The other thing that I want to highlight is chemistry. And you might be thinking, oh, well, it, it doesn't appear to be a, a meaningful difference. This, in fact, is a launching point for our discussion. So we wouldn't just focus on the gains that you're seeing there. We, we then pivot to talking about chemistry. What can we learn, prep, for instance, from English, math, and psychology that can help us maybe address what we're seeing for chemistry? What additional work could we do? Is there literature that we could bring to the table? Are there surveys that we could pursue? What more evidence could we pursue in the spirit of helping better get a grasp for what, what may be going on in chemistry and what we could do differently to improve those success rates in chemistry? You wanna talk about SI, Sabrina? Absolutely. I cannot talk more about SI in a positive way. I love supplemental instruction. I love embedded tutoring so much, not just because I've utilized it in my own classes as a history professor, but because I was a supplemental instructor at a community college in LA. And that's how I really began as an educator. And it was such an empowering experience for me, for me in particular, because I was, I was very timid. I came from a, a poor family and uh, I actually was homeschooled for high school. So I had to go to a community college to really prove myself before going to UCLA because at that time, uh, homeschooling was not respected. And so the first class I took was a sociology class and I performed so well, I was offered a job as a supplemental instructor for sociology. And it was the most empowering experience of my life. And it transformed my entire life and career choices. And tutoring services can be helpful for everybody on campus and can lead to success for everybody on campus if utilized properly and it can increase equity. One of the biggest discussions I've had regarding equity in my classrooms are about the class capacity. I have 55 students in a class and that creates a problem when we're talking about equity and creating a one-on-one -on -one student experience, especially if you're teaching five classes a semester, that's over 250 students. It is very hard to achieve equity in that kind of environment. But a supplemental instructor attached to these large classes really kind of cuts that down, okay? It cuts that challenge down in, in so many ways. And I've had incredible supplemental instructors at my campus and through SLO data, I have been able to prove that having an SI instructor attached to a class improves student success in the classroom. And that is our bottom line. We have incredible tutoring services on campus and it does increase equity and it does increase student success. And we have numerical data to prove it and we have qualitative data to prove it, which is going to be on our next slide. These are some student quotes from the spring 2021 survey on tutors. I'll read them to you. He, the tutor, was very patient with me and answered all my questions. This is very good. 10 out of 10. I will definitely be visiting tutor again because he covered all of my questions and went over material I didn't even know I needed to correct. And third, totally loved my session. I felt very comfortable and was able to have everything I needed for my tutor. She gave me great help and I'm very thankful. And this is something that we can do in an online environment as instructors or even as staff members, we can point people in the right direction. Maybe we don't always have the answer. Maybe we don't always have the support, but we can point people to the right direction where there has been success on campus and the tutoring center is one of them. And these tutors are really good models of excellence for the student. And it is so important 
uh, when the student is going through their college life to have a peer that they can go to and look up to and ask questions from. So Gio, what is the bottom line? Right, the bottom line is do not underestimate the importance of peer support. Yes, thank you. We also, I don't know if you've noticed this, just between me and Gio, we have a welcoming team effort. We really try to support one another in conversations. And we have so many examples of this. Um, Gio, would you like to discuss sure. some of your streamlining oh, projects? I'm sure, I have a couple examples I can allude to. Uh, a lot of the work, in fact, that we've been doing this year has, if anything, reinvigorated our focus in student services for leveraging information. A lot of the kudos there go, of course, to our Vice President of Student Services, Delmi Spencer, um, who has just done so much and working collaboratively with the research office to, again, shine a light on the evidence and, and really bring it to the table. Uh, with respect to the streamlining project, it's one, and I, I know I imagine many of you might be familiar with it, it's a pilot program from the state chancellor's office. And we at Crafton Hills are one of 16, I believe, colleges that are participating. The aim there is to better integrate the planning and budgeting efforts of colleges. And in doing so, best leverage the evidence, best leverage disaggregated evidence and use it as part of those integrative type discussions. And because a lot of these programs are housed in student services, it, it will continue to foster a lot of that collaboration, a lot of that collaborative spirit that we've been, Sabrina and I have been talking about throughout. Also with respect to our student uh, assessment efforts, there's been a lot of work from student services this year in particular to help shape that dialogue and to ensure that we are as a college making the most of gathering that information and using it. In fact, our homegrown SLO platform, we call it the SLO cloud, is now have, has now experienced a name change. It's no longer the SLO cloud. It will now be called the outcomes cloud, an acknowledgement of the work of the student services folks. They do uh, not necessarily always SLO work. They do what, what we call SAO work, student, student, uh, services, oh, I'm losing it now, <laughs> service area outcomes. And that work, of course, is invaluable to enhancing the value that we offer our students. So that two of probably three or four I could generate for you uh, all morning and all afternoon. Sabrina. My experience with this is twofold. One, as a Guided Pathways lead, I've been really trying to connect with individuals all over campus to improve the student experience. But two, as an instructor in the classroom, we use Starfish to connect students with student services that they need. So you can use kudos and flags and our Starfish leadership on campus uh, has been fantastic. Uh, and I, I just can't give them enough compliments for their mm. work because it really is helpful in connecting students with what they need. And also we need to, as um, leaders on campus, really get classified Senate involved and encourage participation and leadership because they have so much feedback as far as the student experience is concerned. And we need to really utilize their knowledge and expertise in the decision-making process. So don't underestimate networking and small acts of kindness and getting these people to communicate with one another and work as a team because we need everybody to make the college experience successful. And this requires, if I may, this requires work. This requires dedication, not just lip service, but consistent, a consistent attempt uh, on, on behalf of the college to work with these different groups like, like classified Senate. The one thing I do wanna add with respect to the kudos earlier, we also have a plethora of evidence that points to the impact that the use of Starfish, the use of things like kudos has on, on student success, a, a substantial one at that. Absolutely. And that goes into, again, you know, knowing your, your community on and off campus. We want to know our students. We want to know the community. And this is actually an image from a newspaper article about uh, the Ukaipa Planning Commission. Uh, they were uh, going to put a movie theater in Ukaipa, which is where our college is located. And instead, they are putting a Kaiser Permanente Medical Center. And so we, we look at that, those events, and we uh, compare it to the success of our CTE program and 
possible growth of a CNA program. Um, and we have incredible uh, committee that is working on um, program viability reports, and that is our enrollment strategies committee. And uh, one of our deans, Dan Word, uh, has done a really good job of working on that report with Keith Words, our vice president. And so they've they've worked hard to read the local economy and act accordingly to serve our community. And that relates to the next slide. Uh, which really reflects um, our database decisions, okay? And Gio, would you like to discuss this quickly? Yeah, sure. And, and a couple of other things I want to add as well. But what you can see here is, is really, when we talk about success of our CT programs, uh, the proof is the pudding, as they say. You can look at those employment numbers. They're, they're just fantastic. The other thing I want to highlight here is, and this speaks to our culture, our processes, and that is in doing this work, we as a committee, this is the Enrollment Strategies Committee, we actually split up the work of looking at the viability of a CNA program. And each of us took on different aspects of that, that, that form and gathered the necessary information to, to get to that endpoint. Another example where we, again, this collaborative spirit is just very palpable is with the, our Ed Master Plan Committee. We recently looked at a one to 200 page document reflective of an environmental scan. Rather than relying, say, on someone like me or just a couple of people to look to the whole document and present it to the group, we split it up among the 12, 14 members of the committee. Different people became experts at different sections of that document. And we met for an hour and a half or two hours to talk about each of those sections so that we collectively have mastery over that evidence. And we collectively can then better position ourselves to, to make the most of that evidence moving forward. Absolutely. And that process can be scary for a lot of individuals. I, before participating in that committee, had no idea um, about the a CNA program and, and what it really meant for the community. Now I'm just gaining knowledge and I'm, I'm not an expert uh, by any means, um, but it's important to get people from all over campus to work on these projects because it creates that collaborative cohort that is necessary for moving forward and improving the community. And we use surveys to measure student interest in new programs. And we're, we're planning on not just using surveys at our college, but also local high schools as well to find out what students are interested in in our area. All right. So as you can imagine, and you can see just over the last 30 or so minutes, evidence is important to us and, and I'm sure to you as well. And when you hear the word data, when you hear the word evidence, I'm sure like me, your first thought is numbers. How, what, what, what sort of numbers, what numerical information can we bring to bear to help guide this conversation? We're no different, but we've also come we've also come to appreciate the value of qualitative information, of that student voice, of that student narrative. And we don't just acknowledge it. We don't just give it lip service. We've actually committed to three different extensive projects since, this is just since fall 19, where we use a focus group a study that was implemented by the RP group to learn all sorts of things from our students. One of the things that we learned was we need to revisit our technology. And so what do we do? With that, well, in fact, we deployed a second qualitative study, one that was actually implemented online during the pandemic to further explore that among other issues. And we learned still then that there's, there's work to be done with our website. It's helpful, people find it helpful, but there's still areas of improvement. And this is largely against, of course, the backdrop of being remote. And so under the leadership of our president, Kevin Horan, we formed a website group in the fall and we funded yet a third qualitative study all done online where we have learned that much more about that online student experience. And in fact, just earlier this week, we as a work group met to discuss those findings and actively start to think through what the strategies might be to implement those findings. So yes, quantitative uh, data always has a place in these discussions, but, but we also acknowledge the role of qualitative and we place a great deal of emphasis in doing that. I would be, uh, it would be remiss of me for not to, for, for me to forget that last point there at Equifax, not specifically tied to qualitative data, but something that when I talk about it, people are very interested in, so I thought I would share. So Equifax, and yeah, yes, it's that Equifax, that, that Equifax, that, that the people that have data on all of us, these people, this group actually 
is, is one that we're partnering with. And this partnership is one that will and has already and will continue to allow us to have access to student wage data, student career information. And as you know, we all know, this is at the heart of what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, that's in many ways, that's the point of why we're even meeting to discuss what we're discussing today and, and getting a sense for what, what that student experience is after they leave us. Are they achieving those further educational outcomes? Are they landing the jobs and the careers that they came to us for? We can begin to shed some light on those very questions with the information that we now have access to and that we will continue to have access to. Equifax has just, to, to, for me to say, they have a robust repository of data would be an understatement. You can well imagine what kind of data we're talking about and we're excited as heck to continue that partnership with them. So Gio, what's the bottom right, line? The bottom line, let's give the people what they want. <laughs> Big database decisions. Yes, heck yeah, absolutely. And that kind of correlates with our theme at our college and that is growth mindset and the power of yet. Um, if we haven't implemented something, we are in the yet stage, we are going to. Um, maybe we don't know everything yet, or we don't know everything that works yet, but we will get there. And every single person has a role to play, whether they are uh, in the community, whether they're administration, whether they're faculty or staff, we all have a role as a leader in our community, and we can all be the difference. And that is our bottom line. We really want to take advantage of everybody who works at our college in our community and transform it into a better world. That's our role as, as educators, and we need strong communication in order to do that. And we, uh, as a college, are working on that, and we have to constantly nurture it. So we are going to end this slide with the most important question, of course, which is how many Roadrunners were in this presentation? <laughs> And then we will, of course, um, in the chat, monitor any questions that you might have. We have 20 Roadrunners. 20. Close. 23? No? No? Uh, I think people are just throwing numbers on there now. No, they are close. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> I think they, they missed the one that we expected them to miss. Uh -huh. Yes, I yes. think that's the one. 24. Jacqueline got it right. Tell him, tell him the trick. Tell him the trick. The trick was one of the images had our actual mascot in it, which is 345. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go with Tim. I think Tim's closest. I think he's he deserves the glory. And that is a database decision right there. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, no, Jacqueline is correct. There are 24. Um, and, oh, did Carlos get it? Oh, he wants a recount. Oh, wow. oh he wants a recount. <laughs> he says he didn't miss it. <laughs> That's great. Oh, I love this. <laughs> Anything for you, Carlos. So yes, there were 24 and um, we just, we want to emphasize, hey, we, we're going through this just like everybody else. We are in the learning process. We're doing the best that we can. And sometimes we have to adjust if we're not um, working properly in certain aspects of our college. So you have to ask those difficult questions. What's working? What needs to change? And you have to call people um, for their failures, if you will, or talk about those failures. And we need to move through it together. And, and in order to do that, you have to create a culture of communication and to address what needs to change. And so you should always ask yourself, what is your college's bottom line? And right now you guys have an expert in the room with Geo. So if you have any database questions, please feel free to ask him, unmute yourself, join us in this discussion because we have Five more minutes to talk about this. <laughs> Anybody? Thank you, Scott. Great presentation, positive energy. Thank you, thank you. Don't be shy. Jacqueline, the coffee kicked in. Yeah, for me too. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> coffee is helpful in getting through these. Could we email you if you have any questions? Absolutely. Gio, would you like to include your email? Oh, sure. Good idea. And I'll include mine. Uh, Gio, a question in the chat um, that Go ahead. got lost with all of the Roadrunner guesses. Um, I don't know if I heard you answer it. Uh, Bernice asked, what tool do you use to survey students? Oh, yes. I'm sorry mm -hmm. I missed that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming this is in reference to the, the qualitative work that, um, that I shared earlier. If that's the case, we use a tool called Qualboard, 
all digitally based. Students, in fact, don't even have to download an app. And kudos, uh, two, two kudos here. One to uh, Ivan Olivares from our office is the researcher principal lead on all of this work. She does <laughs> just, just fabulous work. And incredibly innovative in, in implementing this work. Second kudos and acknowledgements, of course, to, to GIA. In fact, they're the ones that helped to fund that initial. <laughs> and let me know if you have further questions. I'm happy to even set aside time with you to get into more details of what, what quality is, et cetera. Okay. As the honors coordinator of VBC, I do have to thank, thank you for giving a shout out to the Honors Institute. Judy Cannon and Jennifer Flurkey before them did a wonderful job on that. I agree. Judy Cannon is one of our most amazing assets on campus. Absolutely right. So um, I, I have a question, uh, Gio and Sabrina. How how is it that this this culture of leadership of you know giving people rocket fuel and letting them run with it and then you know always bringing it back to to the bottom line and to students? How how did that happen on campus? What were the, what were the conditions that were set to make that occur? I think one of the factors is that we we are a smaller college and we are understaffed. So we are all essential employees. <laughs> Nobody feels left out in the decision making, making process. And um, I think it really came down to Geo and Keith choosing the right leaders for guided pathways. We have um, Josh Robles, Sheila Scott, um, these amazing leads that work with me and uh, our counseling team has been fantastic. And so I think choosing the right people uh, was the first start and allowing those people to do what they do best. Um, my background is in military history and my first speech at the college regarding guided pathways was a pump you up military style speech and they let me go for it. They didn't have to hear it before I gave it. Uh, they didn't ask for an outline before I gave it. They trusted me to do it. And that goes a long way, that kind of trust. Yep. And I think that is one of the key factors from my perspective of why it's been successful. And what I would add to first, the thing that I think this goes back to even that first slide on the, the leadership presence and the role of leadership in the work that we do. Two, uh, I think it's important to to call out the wonderful work that Sabrina has been doing. Sabrina is a transformative figure on our college campus and she, she works tirelessly. And I know, I know she does because we have conversations daily about this work, just tirelessly to learn about what everyone is doing, going to all sorts of meetings, in some cases, just to learn what they're doing. And then more importantly, to use that information to now bring together the different people that she knows need to have conversation, that she's able to, to, to strategize as she's learning and bring together the right people. And again, maybe it helps that we are, we are a smaller college, but to bring people to have those conversations about how we can move forward. And a lot of it means working very closely or hand in hand with student services folks. Great question, Carlos. Okay, I think our time is up. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to email uh, me or Geo. We gave our email in the chat. Um, thank you for attending our session. It was amazing. And we really appreciate the opportunity to speak about what Crafton Hills College is doing and some of the great leadership at our school. <laughs>